Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we've been tracking this week. In Latin America, the news media are playing central roles in two stories. The arrival of Brazilian troops onto the streets of Rio de Janeiro and the aftermath of a disputed election in Honduras. Facebook is dealing with the fallout of the Cambridge Analytica story. Governments in Washington and London are demanding answers. Another big chunk of the Turkish news media is now in pro-government hands. And which Egyptian presidential candidate would you vote for? The one on the left or the one on the right? It's been a busy few years for the Brazilian news media, starting with the impeachment of a president, Dilma Rousseff, in 2016, then covering the controversial policies of her successor, Michel Temer, and then on to the corruption conviction last year of the most popular politician in the country, Lula da Silva. And now, the assassination of a city councillor in Rio de Janeiro, a woman who embodied a new kind of politics on behalf of the country's poor. Marielle Franco's murder was a hit job, clearly intended to send a message. Franco had campaigned against the violent policing of the favelas, urban slums which are mostly populated by Brazilians who share Franco's heritage, African. The coverage of her story has revealed some of the Brazilian news media's attitudes to the poor. Some outlets have used Franco's murder to argue in favor of President Temer's militarization of policing, something Franco herself had opposed. Media coming out of the favelas, however, are telling a different story, one more in line with Franco's own politics. Our starting point this week is Rio de Janeiro. Os cidadãos de bem deste país exigem a investigação rápida e a punição exemplar dos assassinos da vereadora do PSOL, Marielle Franco. Não era. It wasn't an ordinary murder. It was an attempt to silence a voice. Uma voz. É inconcebível que. It's inconceivable that a city councillor is shot four times in the head. Foi assassinado com quatro tiros na cabeça. Marielle's death was a very brutal death, a death that tested us, which warned us that Brazil's democracy is at risk. Since the tragedy happened, Marielle has been our number one story. Even in her death, Marielle Franco drew attention to the causes she had fought for. Her opposition to the creeping militarization of police forces into Brazilian favelas, particularly in her home city of Rio de Janeiro, was one of them. It may have cost her her life. There have been many politicians murdered in Brazil, but most of the time they are involved with the militias or drug trafficking or simply corrupt criminals. That was not the case with Marielle at all. She was actually the opposite of that. It was clear from the beginning that this was a political crime, the first political murder in Rio in decades. And this murder was of a black woman from the favelas, who stood up for those who are poor, black, and live in the favelas. It was impossible for this not to make a huge impact in the news. Marielle Franco had all the disadvantages, black, Poor, gay, a single mother by the age of 19, she went on to get a master's degree in sociology and was elected to Rio City Council, where she advocated on behalf of the people of her favela, Mare. Just over a month ago, President Michel Temer changed the way some of those favelas are policed, adding a military component in what's known as the federal intervention. An army general was put in charge of Rio's police force. Commando teams and other troops have been sent in on security operations. Those raids are often captured by news cameras, so the media coverage has been extensive. And in a cruel piece of irony, the murder of Marielle Franco has been followed by calls for even more troops to be sent into the favelas. Franco strongly opposed sending the military into those areas, saying it was a mistake. The intervention is like a TV spectacle. It's a political power play. It's the central government trying to draw the public's attention away from other issues to raise the president's popularity. President Michel Temer disse que entre 600 e 800 milhões de reais 
devem ser liberados para a segurança do rio. It's also great for the media, especially broadcasters, because it generates shocking images that boost ratings. We're talking here about the power of the media, how they go overboard sometimes, how they cast light on some things and not over others, which creates a false impression. Só nas primeiras horas da manhã, mais de 200 quilos de drogas foram apreendidos e 20 pessoas presas. The result is a whole scenario in which the city is unsafe, and so the public back the federal intervention. Com mais facilidade a intervenção federal. A imagem da TV vale por An image on TV is worth a thousand words, one million arguments. In a visual society, more and more people struggle to read, and the power of images is very strong. It turns violence into a spectacle, which anesthetizes the population. It actually creates the entire context which causes this violence. Analysis of news coverage in Brazil starts with Globo, the country's biggest broadcaster and by far its most influential media company. Globo comes to any story involving the military with excess baggage. The network overtly backed the military government that ruled Brazil from 1964 to 1985, something which it admitted to in 2013 and publicly apologized for. Global retains a right-wing ideology that was on display again in 2014-2015, when it called protesters onto the streets to help depose Dilma Rousseff, a leftist president, over charges of corruption. So when Globo's flagship news magazine, Fantastico, produced a two-hour long special on the killing of Marielle Franco, Franco's supporters were watching carefully, warily. I talked to the editor, I talked to the producer during the shoot, and I asked them not to be sensationalist. I said those exact words. In the end, some people loved it, some people hated it. My critique is that the narrative legitimizes the federal intervention in Rio de Janeiro. After Fantastico did the whole story with the family, at the end of the day, it presented the intervention as a necessity, as justified after Marielle's assassination, when in fact she questioned and criticized it. There were some positive things about the report produced by Fantastico. They humanized the victim. However, one issue that wasn't raised, and this is in keeping with their editorial line, is that Marielle was totally against the intervention. They have a political agenda. We know that there are no truly independent media. No one believes that there are. The coverage the Brazilian news media give this story is affected by their commercial interests. Police on the streets can attract ratings, and also by the way they portray the country. 54% of the population is of African heritage, but the Brazil presented on the airwaves is disproportionately white. Not just the news coverage, but other forms of programming as well. When so few of the anchors, actors, politicians and newsmakers are black, crime stories that include black Brazilians inevitably create skewed perceptions, stereotypes, that tend to be perpetuated by the mostly white press corps doing the reporting. Este jovem seria gerente de um dos pontos de venda de drogas da comunidade de Antares. E infelizmente no Brasil, quer dizer, Unfortunately in Brazil, social inequality has a color and a name. Most of the population is made up of black and poor people, and most of them live in the favelas. Out of this comes the idea that the favela is an evil place, full of criminals and bad apples. Most journalists are middle class, so this discourse gets perpetuated. The media itself must change its perception, because it ends up legitimizing violence. People from the favelas don't trust journalists. When the military entered Mare in 2014, the soldiers would come in with journalists following behind them. You wondered who was the invader, the soldiers at the front or the journalists at the back? How can you talk with the journalist after they come protected by soldiers? How can you speak with a journalist that is wearing a bulletproof vest when you don't have your own, when you're not protected? This is why people of the favela don't trust journalists. 
But whether the people in the favelas like it or not, trust them or not, journalists in the mainstream media are the ones telling their story and selling the security narrative to the rest of Brazil. Marielle Franco saw it another way, and put it another way, in an op-ed she wrote for the Jornal do Brasil. The so-called sense of security, she said, is nothing more than a political and media narrative. The editors say she submitted that article just hours before she was killed. It was published posthumously two days later. The piece was headlined, Ultimas Palavras, Last Words. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Flo Phillips. Flo, a little more than a week ago, news broke on that data analytics firm, Cambridge Analytica, mining the profiles of up to 50 million Facebook users without their consent. What's the latest on that? Put it this way, Richard, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook's CEO, has seen better days. This week, he's been called to testify before the US Congress over data privacy and protection. Now, that's after the US Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, opened an inquiry into whether Facebook engaged in what it called unfair acts. And at the heart of this story lies the issue of Facebook enabling Cambridge Analytica to get hold of all that personal information without people's consent. Exactly. Now, Cambridge Analytica got this data back in 2014, when Facebook allowed largely unfettered access to user information by apps on the site. This means that Facebook may have actually violated a 2011 agreement it made with the FTC regarding the protection of personal data. And for that, they could be charged up to $40,000 per violation. So if you do the math, $40,000 per violation, up to 50 million users, we're talking up to trillions of dollars. Correct. Now, Zuckerberg has also been called to testify by MPs in the UK. They were told this past week by Christopher Wiley, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, that information harvested on Facebook was also used to manipulate British voters into voting for Brexit. Now, so far, Zuckerberg has refused to appear. You've also been looking into a story in Turkey where the country's largest media conglomerate, Doğan Yan, has new owners. What are the details? This is a big development in the Turkish media space, Richard. Doğan has been sold for $1.1 billion. Now, the new owners, a giant conglomerate, the Demerarian Group, are closely aligned with the AK Party and President Erdogan. Doğan had owned around 30% of the Turkish media pie, including the newspaper Hurriyet, the Doğan News Agency, and the TV channel CNN Turk. All of those outlets are now under new ownership. The Demerarian Group had actually already bought two other dailies, Milliet and Vatan, from Doan back in 2011. The editorial lines of both those papers became strictly pro-government pretty much overnight. But the writing's been on the wall for Doan for years now, has it not? In 2009, after Doan's owners fell out of favor with the Erdogan government, the company was hit with a $3.3 billion fine, allegedly for back taxes. The financial pressure started a downward spiral, forcing the company to sell some newspapers, close others, and really rein in critical coverage of Erdogan and his government. Now, according to the French NGO Reporters Without Borders, after last week's sale, nine of the 10 most watched TV channels in Turkey, as well as nine of the 10 most widely read papers, are all under the control of owners aligned with the government. And let's not forget, general elections are slated for next year. OK, thanks, Flo. In the Central American country of Honduras, a political story has been unfolding, one that deserves more coverage than it's been getting. Close to 40 people have been killed, more than 2,000 arrested following the bitterly contested re-election of President Juan Orlando Hernandez to a second term. If not for the rather compliant Honduran media, allegations of electoral fraud might have got more attention. But Honduran mainstream outlets, owned by powerful business groups, have been echoing the right-wing ruling party's narrative of nothing to see here. They're also accusing left-wing politicians and journalists of trying to steal the election and turn Honduras towards socialism, make it another Venezuela. Alternative narratives are difficult to come by, but one radio station has proved an exception to that rule. Radio Progresso is a community station run by Catholic Jesuits. It's been putting voices on the air that Hondurans just don't hear elsewhere. The Listening Post's Cristina Martinez now on the kind of journalism that in Honduras can come with risks. November 26, 2017, election night in Honduras. Two candidates both claiming victory. Total 
total chaos. With 54% of the votes counted, the trend was a clear win for left-wing opposition candidate Salvador Nasralla. But then, the computer system mysteriously broke down. As the hours ticked by, uncertainty grew. Some commentators settled in for the long haul. But one outlet, Honduras' largest private TV station, Televicentro, seemed assured who the winner would be. La situación se ha vuelto mínima, 13,000 votos la diferencia del presidente candidato sobre Salvador Narrala. When the computer system finally came back online a full day later, the vote count had been turned upside down. The right-wing incumbent, Juan Orlando Hernández, was suddenly ahead. La principal corporación... The main media corporation in Honduras, Televicentro, had been saying that despite the opposition candidate being in the lead, votes were slowly coming in from rural areas and they would change the result. This remains the recurring narrative and in the end, it was the truth imposed nationwide. There were differences of opinion. Some media outlets agreed with the court's position that the vote had been completely transparent, while opposition media outlets stated there had been fraud, that there was a dictatorship going on and Orlando was not the president. But a report from the observers of the Organization of American States at no point suggested that fraud had taken place. So most media followed that line. A few outlets, however, weren't ready to accept the election result at face value. Radio Progreso was one of them. Lo que se está instaurando con el continuismo de Ho y con este proceso electoral es una especie de cleptocracia política. Based in the north of Honduras, Radio Progreso is a small radio station with a big following nationwide. More than one and a half million people tune in to listen out of a country of nine million. The station is run by the Catholic Order of Jesuits an organization that does extensive work with some of Honduras's most neglected and least heard communities. I will not call him president because he has seized power and he is illegitimate. But the media keep insisting that there is nothing important going on here in Honduras. Their narrative is deeply ideological and reflects the interests of the winners. When the mainstream media talk about the election, they argue that there was no electoral fraud, but a successful campaign by Juan Orlando Hernández. This narrative conceals the real dynamics of the repression, the constitutional breach and the control of the state by an alliance between the oligarchy, political power and multinationals. Four months since the election, Radio Progreso hasn't stopped demanding answers. Its persistence has put it in the crosshairs of opponents. In December, the station's broadcast antenna in the capital, Tegucigalpa, was knocked down. Online, dangerous and defamatory material has been circulated about the station and its director, Father Ismael Moreno, known as Padre Melo. Padre Melo has always been seen as an inconvenient person for some sectors in power because he's always questioned the local elites. Because we have been questioning what we consider to be a dictatorship, I have had four anonymous false accusations connecting me with drug trafficking and money laundering, promoting violence and smuggling weapons. These are intended to stigmatize us and discredit our work. Recently, a colleague was told, is this you? We are going to kill you. In this highly polarized situation, no threat against this outlet should be considered insignificant. They're important because Radio Progreso is the voice of the dissidents. The majority of media outlets in Honduras are owned by big business, former politicians, and the evangelical and Catholic churches. The result is output that seems overwhelmingly aligned with the interests of the political and corporate establishment. By contrast, in its 61 years on the air, Radio Progreso has focused on providing a platform to voices Hondurans simply don't hear anywhere else. Los más empobrecidos somos los más 
desarrollo para unos pocos, pero no para todos. Perder el territorio es perder la cultura. No existe razón de ser de la comunidad del pueblo garífona si no tiene su territorio. But Radio Progreso's work has meant serious challenges and at times deadly consequences for its staff. In 2011, correspondent Neri Jeremias was gunned down. Three years later, marketing manager Carlos Mejia was stabbed to death. Then in 2016, indigenous rights activist Berta Cáceres was murdered. Cáceres and the station director Ismael Moreno were close friends and had worked together to set up a network of community radio stations called COPIN. A ese espíritu de resistencia que la identificaba se, se mantiene aquí con la gente del COPIN y con toda la gente que lucha en todo el país por una Honduras distinta. Buenas tardes. Berta Cáceres tenía aquí en... Berta Cáceres had found a home at Radio Progreso. I remember that we were once looking at a picture someone had taken of us together and she turned to me and said, let's see who leaves this world first. Her murder was a warning for Radio Progreso, a warning that anyone in the country can be murdered. De ser asesinado. Berta, primero fue... Berta Cáceres was tried in the courts. Then she was tried in the media. Then she was assassinated. We are certain now that whenever a campaign like this appears on social media or any other space, we know there will be a direct form of aggression against that individual. This is the case of Padre Melo and all of his team who are receiving death threats. Que, eh, se ha visto amenazado. The online attacks against Radio Progreso and Ismael Moreno have borne striking similarities to the accusations against Salvador Nasralla and the opposition. Destape ha denominado Nasralla y Mel intentaron robar la elección en alianza con Las Maras. There's a name critics give to this process of smearing, silencing alternative voices, privileging official narratives, cerco mediático, or media siege. A tres de los líderes de mayor importancia del partido de la estrella solitaria. In the nine years since the National Party first came to power, Honduran media have felt the squeeze. Outlets have been closed down, jail terms have been introduced for reporting what authorities deem as justifying or inciting terrorism, and a new law to control social media looms on the horizon. The establishment media are part of a strategy by top businessmen, politicians and multinational corporations to counter any human rights activists and independent journalists who operate outside their system. The establishment media in Honduras are responsible for controlling freedom of speech. In other words, they are mutilating freedom of speech. There have been accusations that the establishment media dominate the landscape. But in truth, we're a small country, just 8 million people, and we have a large variety of media outlets. I don't think there is such a thing as media suppression, because the media here interview all kinds of people, whether or not they share their ideology. Hondurans have long debated who actually controls their media. Now they are arguing over who won the election, who should be running the country. By offering a perspective Hondurans won't find in the mainstream media, Radio Progreso is an anomaly. And with three people already paying with their lives for their work, the station is playing a dangerous game. Alternative narratives, alternative journalism in Honduras. Finally, some election results are foregone conclusions. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi's re-election this past week was an example of that. One by one, potential challengers dropped out, leaving just one other name on the ballot, just enough to give voters the semblance of a choice. The broadcast media were almost entirely pro-Sisi. Egyptian cities have been dotted with billboards plastered with the president's face. Critical voices have been pretty much exiled to the margins of social media, where they've been photoshopping those billboards, asking satirical questions, and providing what passes for political dissent in Egypt in 2018. We'll leave you with some of that, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.